Thank you to uh, both Dr. Shushard and Dr. Morgan for very rich and, and stimulating papers. Uh, this is a time now for questions, so if you've written them down on index cards, that would um, be wonderful. I was struck by how well these papers uh, paired with each other, uh, even though they emphasize very different aspects of uh, print in the Bible and the Reformation. One paper was a paper of sharp theoretical distinctions, highlighting some of the ways that media theory might help us think about possibilities that suddenly come onto the scene with printing, and another paper reminding us and showing us in, in rich ways of, of the, about the complicated historical process that led to the consolidation of Welsh Protestantism. Um, I was very struck by um, Morgan's Bible's statement that faith comes through hearing <laughs> and that the, the um, scriptural truth had previously been inaudible. I contrast that with the McLuhan theory of Protestantism, which might suggest that faith comes through reading. Um, and so I'll begin with a question that'll open up to, to either speaker. Um, maybe both could comment on it, which is, uh, which was it? Is the Protestant Reformation primarily a reading event? Or, as, we've, as, as the Welsh example suggests, um, hearing is vitally important to the printed Bible as well. If it doesn't sound right, <laughs> it lacks authority. So I'll start that as a first question and then um, uh, ask, ask some of the, the ones that we have here. Um, well, I think, we, I think we would both concur. It was definitely a hearing event because the readers in the Reformation were the minority's minority. So the, the actual movement of the people would have been based on what they heard from the literate. And, and my, my impression from Dr. Morgan's paper was that if Salisbury had had the wisdom of Richards, he'd have been a better bestseller. Yeah. Uh, and and he, if he had imitated uh, Luther's spelling uh, practices, he could have had a, a bigger audience. It, 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 it's, in a way, it, it, it's both and rather than either or. Because what the, the printed Bible, the, 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 there were manuscript portions of scripture in Welsh doing the rounds previously, as it was true in, in, in all these, these countries. But to have a specific especially in 1588 when you did have, which was a, a masterpiece, a literary masterpiece, not only a scholarly masterpiece, but it, it, it connected with the people. It was a book, it was a book. Uh, but it was a book which was meant to be here. You, you listen to the reading of the word of God, you listen to the preaching of the gospel, but it's from now, not from a, a manuscript, a written manuscript written by a monk, but a book, there were a thousand of them which cost a pound each in the parishes, which meant it revolutionized what, 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 what went on. And with the list of um, authors that I put up on the, the whiteboard behind me, um, um, these were handbooks of, which were meant to be read. And of course, these were not pulpit Bibles, but they, they were books which were read at home. So you have now the, the progression of progress whereby what is still something which is heard now has the wherewithal to become something which is seen and written and pondered upon by the individual. So it was a process which began and which would culminate in uh, the 18th century, the 19th century, the 20th century by uh, being what we do. Yes, we go and listen to a preacher, but also we read it for ourselves. So it was the be beginning of a process, but it began with this huge, huge emphasis on the listening of the word of God, the hearing of the word of God. A related question from um, the audience for Dr. Morgan. Uh, did the William Morgan Bible shape the way uh, the Welsh spoke and the phrases they used in the same way the King James Version did for the English. Yes, 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 yes. Um, uh, um, were it not for the 1588 Bible, North Walian people and South Walian people probably wouldn't be able to understand themselves. But, but since then, there is, there, there, there is a, a, a lingua franca, a common 
uh, means, which is one of the reasons why Welsh has preserved itself, would you believe, into the 21st century as a living language, right? As a living language, which hasn't really happened in other places. But had it not been for old William back in 1588 giving us a, um, a, a standardized version, yes, it has been superseded to a certain extent, but it was massively important. So you didn't have um, uh, uh, um, a variety of, of uh, uh, dialects, but you had one official language. A uh, question for Dr. Shushart. Uh, how did the printing press contribute to the evolution of doctrines of scripture? How there are specific ways in the 16th century that the printing press shapes uh, doctrines of scripture? Uh, the short answer is I have no idea. The long answer is uh, that's a current research project. Uh, I'm, I'm presenting another paper later this summer on the Council of Trent. So I'm looking specifically at the ways the seven sacraments were reduced to one and the ways in which the 13, 13 of the um, resolutions of the Council of Trent were themselves sort of questions or kind of litmus test authority questions on the validity of speech versus uh, writing. But uh, the, the actual answer would probably be another 30 pages. <laughs> I'll give you a second question. Sure. Uh, and I'm not sure what this one means. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you understand. I don't know if it's an inside reference to you. Is the printing press a second Tower of Babel? I'm pondering this. Yeah, a second Tower of Babel. If so, is the internet a third? Um, yeah, that is actually, whoever asked that probably has read Eisenstein's book, and that's a, that's a reference she makes. So I think, I think um, it is, there's also an artist who's actually done a Tower of Babel of books. Um, and uh, I, I think Eisenstein is quoting the Victor Hugo quote in extents, uh, extensively that I, that I give you a portion of. So the, the answer is yes, it is the second Tower of Babel. The internet though, as I alluded to at the end, is a return to secondary orality. Digital, digital media returns us to the ear, um, primarily. And so uh, these questions, I think, are more relevant 500 years later than they are if they were, if we were having this discussion 100 years ago. A question for both speakers. Um, Someone has asked, I'd like to hear both of you speak about politics in the 15th and 16th century and their relationship to new media, especially the way that monarchs and local authorities were able to become part of the text of the Bible as um, patrons on title pages or with the sort of imprimatur of, of, of monarchs. Um, for, question for both speakers. I was also curious um, in the example of Wales, uh, whether there was any debate uh, in England about potential negative consequences of encouraging uh, Welsh in the vernacular and the printing of the Bible in the vernacular. Uh, clearly there were theological reasons for it, but were there, were there concerns about possible political implications? But those are two, that's the second part of the question. Okay, fine. Well, again, uh, the quirks of history. Um, the, um, Wales lost its independence to England, and this is where I become very sort of animated, <laughs> right? Uh, as early as, well, the Act of Union occurred in uh, 1542. 1542, uh, um, where we were subsumed into the English state. The one thing that the English could not do was to rid, of, rid us of our language and our, our, identi our cultural identity, though it did merge us into the political structures of the English state. Even now we talk about England and Wales, right? Scotland is different. It was only in 1707. We talked about the Scottish Kingdom, the, the Northern Kingdom, which had its independence until then. Wales lost its 
its uh, political independence. But in the providence of God, as I believe, it, it found its, 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 its cultural identity. And what these bishops did, who on the one hand, they, they believed in the integration, the political integration of England and Wales, but they also believed in order for that to be effective, we had to get the Welsh people to take pride in their own identity as members of this new state, right? Whereas the English, paradoxically, are the interlopers. They are Johnny-come-lately, right? This was our... This was uh, our island, the Isle of Britain. The actual word Britain is a Welsh word, Pradine, the Isle of Britain, right? We are the original British people. The English are Johnny come lately, right? <laughs> Henry VIII, and especially Henry VII, realized he was a canny, canny politician, like as was David Lloyd George, a canny politician. And he said, well, the way to get the Welsh on board is for me to take pride in the fact that I too am Welsh. That was Henry VII. So therefore, let us give the Welsh people their, they can't speak in English, it'll be a long process to get them to learn English. It's important for us to save their souls. We'll save their souls through their own language and at the same time, give them a pride in their own identity as Welsh people within the context of this because it is uh, Henry VIII, Henry VII, well, and, and Elizabeth, was also a Tudor monarch who gave them this. So the political aspect was deeply Im Im embedded in the, um, in the religious element, but culturally it preserved the, um, not, the, not the political independence, but the cultural independence of Wales indeed until this day. It's only in the 19th century that you have uh, nationalism as a political force, but in the 18th and 17th century, it is very much a cultural uh, patriotic force. I would just say that the, uh, one of the ways of reading the German Protestant Reformation is as a Germany versus Italy uh, debate, and so the perception of the Germans being unfairly taxed in these uh, indulgences and other uh, church dues for the rebuilding of buildings in Italy would have naturally lent itself to political uh, infighting. And so you can, if, if you read the histories, uh, there's, there's pretty good indications that the uh, dukes and archdukes and bishops and electorates uh, in Germany have a reason to side and agree with Luther that is uh, ostensibly theological, but more substantively political. So. Um, I, I just received a question that might follow up on, on uh, Professor Morgan's comments about uh, Welsh history, it appears that some books were published in London. Was there a publishing industry in Wales? If not, how did key reforming figures relate to English publishing houses? Well, again, the answer to that, there were no printing presses in Wales. You had to go to London uh, or, or else to Cambridge or to Oxford. Uh, and all these people, they were either Oxford educated or Cambridge educated. That is the Welsh used the system, right? If they were subsumed, we'll use the system for our own good, and that's what they did. It's only in the 18th century and the 19th century that you do have what becomes a flourishing uh, 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 book industry in Wales itself with the presses. But at that time, you either had to go to Oxford, Cambridge, or to London to get things published. A question for... Uh Dr. Shushart, uh, to what extent did the printing press create or cause Western individualism? I think your uh, lecture, your, your paper suggested that it played a major role. Maybe we could rephrase this as uh, how or what are some of the ways in which the printing press contributed to Western in individualism? Well, the, the starting point for it is probably the minting of coins in the 6th century BC from McLuhan's point of view, and prior to that would be the alphabet itself. 
So what writing does and then what printing does is sort of an acceleration of what McLuhan and Logan call the alphabet effect. So uh, one of the kind of interesting angles McLuhan takes on it is uh, psychological states and he says schizophrenia may be a necessary consequence of literacy. It's interesting in the literature of schizophrenia or of the idea of a double. In English literature we have uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde but before that in English there's James Hogg's Confederate uh, Confessions of a Justified Sinner but the novels with doppelgangers goes back to German literature of the 16th and 17th century because the term doppelganger is a German term. So from the very culture that produced the printing press. Um, so the idea of an individual self that comes out of, uh, I, th I think one way of looking at it is look at the, again, depending on the translation, look at the five or six references to conscience in the Old Testament under almost completely oral and acoustic uh, cultural conditions versus 26 uh, or 30 references in the New Testament under manuscript conditions. So the idea of a private individual self and identity, um, you see that growing and then with, with Renaissance art and perspective taking over, you see the loss of the Gothic cathedral which is an acoustic space and then the rise of individual uh, egos, you might say, in painting. Um, so it's a long history, and each of these technologies are just um, magnifiers of it. I, I would also go back to the other question uh, that was about doctrines, that it's, it's, not, um, it, it's not that the new technology eliminates the old sense. It just uh, magnifies it or puts it out of distortion. So if we're saying the Reformation is an emphasis on hearing and on listening, then uh, that's obvious in, when you look at the iconoclasm and the destruction of statues, the destruction of stained glass windows, the destruction of, of visual uh, iconography. Um, so a sudden new emphasis in the Reformation on the Old Testament's second commandment, whereas now under electronic conditions, uh, we almost all go to churches with, where we have screens and we accept it as completely normal to, to produce graven images. So. Uh, and, and again, even the ways in which the printing press produced graven images and um, cartoons to communicate the message to the masses that were illiterate. It's, it's never, I think it, Dr. Morgan said it well, it's not an either or, it's a both end. So maybe I could follow that up with a, an either or question. <laughs> if this will kill that and, ra and video killed the radio star, who or what are the internet's Christian casualties? <laughs> Well, I, I, the, uh, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, 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 I am writing a book called uh, Presence in the Age of Absence. Uh, it's confronting the seven vices of the virtual life and uh, narcissism, disembodiment, goallessness, impatience, desensitization, ignorance, and I forget the other one. Uh, but, but those, those are the things that we're at risk of losing now. And of course, all of those, uh, the antidote to all of those is specific Christian virtues that have been promulgated by scripture throughout uh, the ages. That brings us to the end of our questions. Uh, thank you to both speakers for very rich papers and wonderful session. There will be a coffee break now from 3 until 3.30, and the next session will resume at 3.30. So thank you very much to both speakers. <laughs>